Hello and welcome to thepopular.com. We bring you live news, we bring you sports, we bring you everything we possibly can. But it's nice to have some perspective from off the field as well sometimes because we are doing so much commentary. We've decided to get Sri Lanka's most accomplished uh, commentator and one of the most experienced commentators that we can call upon and say proudly is a Sri Lankan. He's visiting us in the studio here for the Royal Thomian match and of course to escape the English winter. And I speak of none other than Mr. Lucian Vijay Singer who has joined us here on the Papare.com to tell us a little bit more about what has been a coloured career as a commentator for the BBC and the SLBC and a host of uh, other radio stations. Uh, good morning, Lucian. Welcome. A very good morning to you, Sean. I'm delighted to be here. Fantastic to have you as well. Thank uh, you. You've uh, been a commentator for how many years now, Lucian? Well, since 1971, that was my first effort, the Royal Thurman match. And then immediately thereafter, more or less, we emigrated to England. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing commentaries ever since. And uh, you've always been a cricket commentator. What was your love for the sport? How did you first get into it? I always had a passion for the sport from my young days. We used to be glued to the radio. There was no television in those days. I was growing up listening to the England-Australia test matches. And that's how I grew a tremendous passion for the game. I played cricket. I started at Trinity College. Mm -hmm. I was in the under-12 team. And then in 1951, after five years at Trinity, uh, we moved to Colombo and I was at Royal College then and I was there till 58. I played cricket for Royal. Unfortunately, I didn't quite make it to the big match. because only 11 members of the team, unfortunately, so I couldn't make it. But I happened to be 12th man and I did a bit of fielding because one of my players got injured. And that, was, that was really a, an interesting and exciting time for me. It's any schoolboy's dream, I think, to play for your side in the big match. Mm -hmm. I couldn't actually do that, but actually at least I feel it, which is a good thing. And that passion has strengthened over the years. And uh, so I, now I don't play anymore, obviously. And so I enjoy doing commentaries. Which, um, and uh, you move from Candy to Colombo. Mm. Any particular reason it might have been difficult for you to make that transition from Trinity to Royal? Was the rivalry always as fierce? Uh, it wasn't that difficult to do the transition, really. It was that my father was transferred okay. from to Columbus, so we had to move. And I had to sit an entrance exam. Fortunately, I got through, and uh, so there I am. So I was at Trinity, uh, at Trinity for five years, and then Royal. Wonderful time in both years. As long as I was at Trinity, we kept winning the Bradbury Shield. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, the other way around. But as long as I was at Trinity, Royal kept winning the Bradbury Shield. And the first year I came to Royal, Trinity won the Bradbury Shield. But I was happy, because that was my first year, so I didn't mind. Mm -hmm. I still had my divided loyalties. But as the years passed by, the loyalty switched over to Royal. And it's been a very friendly rivalry between the two schools. And you've been watching cricket for a long time, obviously, uh, Lucian. What do you notice as a marked difference, would you say, between now and the cricket that you played back then? Well, in a way, Sean, okay, it's very difficult to compare eras because the games are played under different conditions. The people try to say so-and-so is second Bradman or second Lindwall or whatever. Mm. You just can't do that. But the main difference that I see now, rather than comparing eras, is the fielding and the innovative innovation of stroke play. In the, the old days, it was just test cricket and nothing else, but then the ODI format came in. Mm -hmm. And even when it first came in, the 1975 World Cup, for example, 60 over match, 250 runs was supposed to be a brilliant score. Mm -hmm. And that was just four runs and over. Sure. Now it's 50 overs and 320 isn't enough. So you can see all that is because of the innovative stroke play that has developed over the years. You'd never had reverse sweeps and switch shots and uh, scoops and uh, deal scoops and mm -hmm. all, all these sorts of innovative shots that have come in over the years. And now, the T20 has made it even more innovative. Mm -hmm. Every ball is virtually, you have to score off. And 225 runs these days of 20 overs isn't enough as Bangladesh yeah. proved against Sri Lanka. Sure. So that's the, that's the extent to which the scoring rate has improved. Mind you, the bats have almost doubled in size. Yeah. They're huge now. Uh, the outfield has been shortened. Boundary lines mm -hmm. have come in a bit. So, you're scoring at the rate of seven, eight runs, and in the latter overs, you're 12, 15, 16 runs and over. It's amazing 
uh, shots that are played these days. Yeah, it, it really is uh, quite interesting to see what would have been abhorrent in your day is kind of encouraged now. Exactly. But do you think that that's a good thing, Lucian? Or do you think that people should probably cut their teeth I'm assuming you're a traditionalist in, in a sense, that because you uh, grew up watching cricket in a particular era. Uh, but do you think that those fundamentals held those players good and schoolboys should probably still be sticking to that? Well, there are two schools of thought. Uh, you're right, I'm a connoisseur of cricket. I go for the five-day test yeah. cricket because there's so much that can happen in five days. The pendulum swings one way, then the other. Conditions during the five days can change. And just a couple of wickets, a brilliant catch here and there could change the complexion of the game. But nowadays, it's just crash, bang, wallop, isn't mm -hmm. it? From ball one, you have to score. A dot ball is a disaster if you're batting. Brilliant for the bowling side. And the fielding, though, has improved beyond recognition. And there was a time in, in, in good old days, if you watch England-Australia test matches, a ball is hit past extra cover, and you'd be almost escorting the ball to the boundary. But now they dive and slide and it's a relay throws and all manner of things. Brilliant for the game. It's a spectacle now. The fielding standards have improved beyond recognition. Brilliant. And uh, that way the game has changed totally. And from an entertainment value and money-making value, the ODI and the T20 more particularly has now gained importance in a way. And test matches, unfortunately, are receding into the background. Very sad for me. And you find lots of test players, now more in Ali for one, mm. and there are one or two others who have now said they're not playing test cricket anymore, and they are going for the shorter version of the game. Because there's money in it, yeah. and their career is lengthened. Sure. So in a way, it's sad, but you know, it's different eras, and different game, and different people are interests. So it's, it's, that, it, who knows what will happen in the next mm -hmm. uh, 10, 15 or 20 years. Yeah, we can only imagine. Yeah. Uh, but tell us about your career as a commentator, how it started. It's an interesting story. You just got off your car, walked into uh, Ceylon Broadcasting Corporation at the time and demanded that you be given an opportunity. Well, demanding is not the right <laughs> word. But you know, I always thought I could do a good job as a cricket commentator. I knew the game mm -hmm. inside out. I had a good vocabulary. So all you're doing is describing what you see mm -hmm. and what's difficult about that. That's what I thought. So I just, one day, I just stopped my car, walked into uh, Ceylon Broadcasting Corporation, there's a counter there at the entrance hall, in the foyer. I said, excuse me, I'd like to be a cricket commentator. And after the chap fell off his chair laughing, <laughs> he said, okay, we are actually looking for new voices. And he said, hold on a minute, and somebody came from inside the bowels of the CBC. And I said, this is what I'd like to do. And uh, he said, yeah, okay, um, we'll give you a go. And he uh, said, you'll have to come in and have a test commentary for about 15 minutes yeah. and imagine a match going on in your head. And they gave me a date and a time, which, so I turned up and I was given 15 minutes. They put me in the studio and this guy outside with the controls, and he said, now when the red light comes on inside, you start. So I had this match going on in my head, and I was ready to go for 15 minutes. And after about five minutes, he stopped it. So I thought, oh my goodness, that just must have been terrible. That's why they stopped it. But when I came out, he said, that was very good. He said, this is only a technician. And he said, now you'll have to go and meet Mr. Livy Vijayamana, who was the uh, director general at the time. So I was marched into his room, sat on the side of his desk, not on the side of his, in a chair on the side of his desk. And then he called in chaps like Prosper Fernando, mm -hmm. Vijay Correa, Jimmy Barusha, and one or two others. They all came and sat in front of him. And then they played this recording through into his room. That's not me. I heard it my voice for the first time. Is that really me? And I saw these guys looking at each other and then after a while, they stopped it, and Mr. Vijayamana said, um, excuse me, maybe I'm blowing my own trumpet here, but he turned around and said, I never realized that we had so much talent in this country. Yeah. And he asked Mr. Prosper Fernandez, put him on the Royal Thumian match straight away. Mm -hmm. And this was sometime in February, so I was on the 
1971 match in March. And that was your first stint? I'm sorry? That was your first stint? That was my very first live broadcast. And funnily enough, as coincidence would have it, my fellow commentators were the doyens of cricket commentaries at the time, Lucian de Sousa mm -hmm. and Bertie Wichersinger. So when they introduced me, I've been got an hour young commentator and it's Lucian Wichersinger. I thought, can't be right, it's either Lucian de Sousa or Bertie Wichersinger. I have a combination of the two. Yes. How strange. Yeah, what that was an interesting coincidence. Yes, yeah, very interesting. So that was my thing. And it, it went, it went, uh, went well. Mm -hmm. And then that was in March. In June, we were off to England. Oh, so you were just <coughs> here for about three months after you started three off? Three months. We emigrated. And then I, I was in Birmingham. Uh, my home county is Warwickshire. Um, went to the Warwickshire Cricket Club. Told them of my interest. I joined the club. And there's something called a hospital radio, which was operating from Warwickshire, giving commentaries on the matches, going out into the local hospitals. Mm -hmm. So I did a bit of that for a while. While I was working, this was just freelance. And um, then in 1982, the first test match, mm -hmm. England versus Sri Lanka, and <clears throat> the SLBC now, it was not the SLBC now, they sent me a letter inviting me to join the panel because over the years I had gained knowledge of the English cricket scene, the cricketers, and I was doing commentary there. So they sent me a ticket, Al Anka sent me a ticket, I came over and did some commentaries. And the first match was against um, President's Board 11 or okay. something at Askiria. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and there, our commentary box was next door to the BBC. And Peter Baxter, who was the producer at BBC, and we used to just cross each other and uh, we got to know each other. He got to know that I worked and lived in England. And he said, well, after a while, he said, um, Lucian, would you like to join our BBC panel for the 1983 World Cup? You can cover all the Sri Lanka matches. Mm -hmm. I nearly beat his arm off. <laughs> that is really what I wanted. Mm -hmm. I said, yes, of course, you've got me. And then the rest is history. In 83, I did the, all the Sri Lanka matches. Mm -hmm. And we won only one match that year. That was against um, New Zealand. Mm -hmm. That was played at Derbyshire. Am I talking too much? No, not at all. And uh, we won the match and it wasn't my turn because we get 20 minute slots mm -hmm. every hour. And it wasn't my turn, but as Sri Lanka was winning, they said, Lucian, come and do your slot right. earlier. Just take Sri Lanka home. And uh, I brought them home with wow. my commentary. Roy Dyer scored the winning runs. Mm -hmm. And up to now, they play a summary of the whole series. They pick out important matches. And they picked out that match because that was the only match Sri Lanka mm -hmm. won. And there it is in perpetuity. I'm saying, well played Sri Lanka at the end of the match, having won the match. So that's there for posterity. That's quite a historic uh, occasion to be part of, uh, Lucian. Do, do you look back at it and feel, wow, I didn't feel it at the time, but it's, I feel really good that I was there. Oh, yes, it was. And, and let me also tell you that I am, <laughs> there can only be one first time, I'm the very first Sri Lankan to ever do ball by ball mm -hmm. cricket commentaries for the BBC. Wow. There's Garvini Grasena before who did summarising, mm -hmm. sort of in between, he used to come and give specialist comments. But as far as ball by ball was concerned, I was the first Sri Lankan to do it for the BBC. Thereafter, there have been others, but mm -hmm. I was the first. And a wonderful spell to meet heroes of mine as I was listening to the radio here whilst growing up and went there and I had shared a commentary box with people like Brian Johnston. Mm -hmm. Uh, Christopher Martin Jenkins, Henry Blofeld, Dennis Compton, Trevor Bailey, Jim Laker. Those are the Hollywood stars of cricket Freddie commentary. Truman, yeah. yeah. They, were, they were my summarizers. Yeah. I, mean, I was doing ball by ball and they were my summarizers. Wow. It was amazing. And so, so these are all guys you would have been listening to the radio, the wireless as it was back yeah. then, yes. and listening to them play. That's right, yes. I still remember listening to Freddie Truman bowling to Peter Burge, mm -hmm. the famous match at, match at uh, Manchester, when he took the new ball. And Peter Burge thrashed him all around. The, the new ball goes faster, as you know. And I still remember that commentary very clearly. It was glued to the radio. It was 9 o'clock in the night. Wow. Match played in um, Manchester, Old Trafford. But now to share a box with him and for him to call me Lucian, fantastic. Well, commentating on that World Cup win for Sri Lanka in 83 yeah. and also with the inaugural test match which you were part of, uh, what are the other 
standout memories you have of moments in the field that you described, uh, Lucian? Well, winning the World Cup in 1996, I was there again at um, Lahore, mm -hmm. the Gaddafi Stadium. And um, as I told you a while ago off air, when it came to Sri Lanka winning, the commentary was given to the singular commentator, mm -hmm. quite rightly, because the people listening back home were there. And, um, but I had to do the summary of the match. Mm -hmm. And I'm very proud of the summary. It was just off the bat, you mm -hmm. see, I had nothing prepared. I think there might be a recording somewhere at the SLBC, but it came out so well that I was complimented by the SLBC verbally. I've got nothing in writing. Mm -hmm. If I can lay my hands on a, the, the recording of that summary, I'd be delighted, but I haven't bothered to approach them. So that was a highlight, winning the World Cup. And when I walked out of the Gaddafi Stadium at Lahore, I was 10 feet tall. The Sri Lanka had wow. won, won there. Yeah. And the people do kind of take it for granted when they switch their radios on, they switch their TVs on. But somehow you are the medium between the action and the person in the living room or in their car. And that is something you take pretty seriously, isn't it? Lushan? Very seriously indeed, because I do a lot of research mm. before I go for the match. I've got all my data. Because we were not provided with those here, mm. particularly in SLBC and uh, BBC, they give you all the stats. Mm. But here there was nothing. Mm -hmm. I had to prepare my own stats. And when I came into the box to find the other guys coming in, nothing in their hands, I used I to share my stats with them because we're all working together. And it is vital that you bring the game alive to your mm -hmm. uh, viewing audience, your listening audience rather, on radio. Because what I was told by the BBC that you must imagine that you're talking to a whole load of blind people. Mm -hmm. They obviously can't see what's going on because they're in their homes or in their cars. So you've got to describe every little thing that's going on, not just A-balls to B and B, it's the ball to C and C fields and returns, but everything around the ground, what's happening, every little thing. You know, even if a bird flies across your window, you can just mention that, make it exciting. See what's happening in the crowd, how people are cheering mm. and throwing their hats in there and carrying trays full of beer from the pub to their seats and mm -hmm. describe all that. So it's just wonderful and just really good. So you have to bring it alive mm -hmm. and also mention a few anecdotes of past matches. Sure. Make it interesting. And I had all those stories with me. And I remember when Jaya Surya was approaching his 300 odd runs he scored against mm -hmm. India. I had all the landmarks where he was passing so and so and so and so and so and so and, so and all those statistics. Of course, I shared it with the others. So when I finished my 20 minute spell, then I passed it on to the next guy and he carried on. But without those, it wasn't interesting. Mm -hmm. So now his next man is so and so, he has yeah. to pass that. And ultimately, of course, unfortunately, he didn't make it, he didn't break the record. Mm. It was exciting. So those sort of things are important. You must have your stats. You must come prepared. That's vital. I think that uh, stands across all industries, actually. Everything. It's not just... Yeah. Everything. So um, do you think video has killed the radio star? No, I don't think so at all, no. Okay. Uh, I think, on the contrary, if you look at the BBC now, now when, I, when I, and even in my time when we were doing commentaries for the BBC, lots of people used to say they watch the TV, turn the sound off, mm -hmm and listen to the radio. So I think it's still happening in England. I don't know about here, mm -hmm. but if I'm watching cricket on um, TV here, I don't listen to the TV at all. Okay. I watch the pictures, but put the radio on. If it's a good commentator, I listen. If not, I just knock it off. Okay. Because um, sadly, uh, no, I'll, I'll leave that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what was, your, what was the match you've seen at Warwickshire that was your most uh, memorable moment? The most memorable was when Brian Lara scored 501. Wow. I was there. You were there. I was there. Fantastic. <laughs> Mind you, I, I was working then, but I heard on the radio that mm -hmm. he was doing something, and I just knocked off and... And went to the ground. Went to the grounds, mm -hmm. because I was a member there and watched the match. And that was terrific. It was, he was in a brilliant purple form at that time. Who's the best cricketer you've seen? Best batsman, Lucian? There again, it's very difficult. I mean. Mm -hmm. I would put Brian Dara, Sachin Tendulkar in one bracket. I haven't seen Don Bradman. Mm -hmm. 
but Brian Lara and Sachin Tendulkar definitely. And then there have been a host of others. I mean, you know, pretty and Sri Lankan batsmen too. I mean, look at Aravind the Deceva, he was very good. Um, going back, for st as far as stylists are concerned, and I love the elegant stroke play, the David Gower type. Mm. Now, we had them. We had Michael Tessera, Stanley Jayasinghe, and latterly, Mahela Jayawadhanam. I remember seeing him in that first test match where Jayasuri scored this 340-odd. He came in and from ball one, he was timing the ball so beautifully and he scored 60-odd runs. And I said on air, here is class. This is a star of the future. And so he was. Yeah. That's, I love to watch really stylish, elegant stroke play. Um, as opposed to someone like Dilip Mendes, he was a good batsman, but he was crash bang wall up with him. Mm -hmm. and, you know, there wasn't any elegance or style, just hard brute force. But as as far as um, elegance is concerned, Jai Water every time. Mahela Jai Water. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, from you, Sri Lanka, yes. you won't uh, you won't find me debating that with you, uh, Lucian. But apart from preparation, what is your advice to any young commentators out there who might want to take the, take it on? Well, first you must know the game inside out. You have to know all the rules, regulations. If you're going for a match, get if it's an ICC match, get the playing conditions, the number of overs per day, when the ball is changed, new balls, and all these real rules and regulations you must know, and. It helped me because I was also a qualified umpire, qualified as an umpire in England. So I knew all the rules and regulations which helped. It helps you to do that. And then prepare, come ready with your information and st stats. Bring a book with you if you like with all the stats. You can get them now on mm. Google. Yeah. Uh, quick info, you can get all the stats you need. So don't come unprepared. Come with all the information you can. Have some cricket anecdotes with you. And. Um, do your homework. That's the important thing. Like with every profession, do your homework and be prepared. Was there anyone you looked up to while you were listening to the radio as a child or of as course, a teenager? Of course, John Arlott, Brian Johnston. They were the, the only two famous guys at mm -hmm. that time. Uh, Henry Blofeld came later on. And the Australian was Alan McGilvery. Mm -hmm. He was very good. What about the current crop? Uh, Jonathan Agnew was very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I worked with him together. Uh, the World Cup. Mm -hmm. um, there are the youngsters. Uh, Henry Blofeld has retired. Chris Martin Jenkins is sadly no more. And the other guy is Simon Mann. I mean, they're, they're all pretty good. But uh, Jonathan Agnew, I think, is very good indeed. Mm -hmm. So you're going on 79 this year, Lucian? Well, I will be 79 in July. You've been uh, retired for 24 years now, you yes, tell me? Yes, I have. I retired at 55. Fortunately, I was able to do it. And we love traveling, my mm -hmm. wife and I on our, on our own. The children have grown up, they're married, and very successful. So we love traveling and mm -hmm. we love cruising. Wow, okay. So we do as much as we can. But every winter we come here, mm -hmm. catch up with uh, family. friends, relations, family, mm -hmm. and take in the big match and all that. And when we go back, we'll go on a cruise somewhere. And then, what yeah. aspects of Sri Lanka, apart from the sunshine, do you miss most? friends, friends and relations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they are an intrinsic part of my life. They always will be. And I miss them when I'm not here. I still have a brother and a sister here. Okay. I've got a brother in England as well. He lives in Cheltenham. My wife is a sister in London. And loads of nieces and nephews. I miss them all. So they make up when we come back. And I'm glad that my children are doing well in England. So. I'm not responsible mm -hmm. for them anymore Any in more. that respect. Okay. So, Was it tough though when you first went there in 71? Oh yes, it was extremely difficult. First to get used to the weather. Mm -hmm. The total cultural shift, isn't it? And I couldn't understand uh, the English that was being spoken in Birmingham because the accent was so terrible. The Brahmis. The Brahmi accent. I thought they were speaking a foreign language. <laughs> I really had to listen intently to understand them. You know, there are so many stories, but there are too many to, to, to uh, recount here, but, <laughs> yeah. And when, so. you, when you look back uh, over the career that you've had in banking and finance and also in uh, commentary, um, Lucian, which one would you say gives you more joy? 
that's a difficult question. I haven't actually thought of it. They've given me joy in different ways. Obviously, my banking and finance gave me a living and um, a comfortable life. This gave me joy, enjoyment and pleasure in a different way. The cricket mm -hmm. commentaries, because that was something I always looked forward to and I thoroughly enjoyed. But my working life, I had to do. Mm -hmm. Cricket commentaries I didn't have to do, but I did because I enjoyed it. It was fun, Partic particularly in the BBC box. Get chocolate cakes and all those things because of Brian Johnston. Mm -hmm. And it was real fun. Whereas in the SLBC box, you don't get all that. That camar camaraderie mm -hmm. and friendship isn't there. The rapport you have with people and uh, the friendship and so on. Mm -hmm. It's very sort of down to earth. And, and you felt properly accepted in, in England? And oh, very much. There wasn't much an issue with the color of your skin? Or None or whatsoever. Like the, the, I put that down to the wonderful education I had at Royal. They make you fit for life in any country. And I was, I'm easily adaptable. Mm -hmm. As they say, I can move with paupers, I can move with kings. No problem at all. My only difficulty is this, and I'm ashamed to admit this on air, but I will, are my knowledge of Sinhalese is very, very poor. My vocabulary is very poor. I can't give a commentary in Sinhalese, I'm just not able to. And that's because of the system at the time. We were all taught in English and nothing else. Sinhalese was not important. We had only one period for the whole week at that time, and we didn't bother because we didn't think Sinhalese will become that important, it's not spoken outside the country. And sadly, I was totally wrong, single is very important, I'm so glad that it's given its place of importance in the country. But unfortunately, I'm, I'm not able to participate. Now, if I listen to single news, I just can't understand a thing. Mm -hmm. Huge words I've never heard of. I can understand a little bit here and a little bit there. So I make up the gap about my imagining what it might have mm -hmm. been. So I make up my own news. That way I find it's a bit of a shortcoming for me because I can't understand the people that speaking these huge words it's got beyond me. Lucian, I can't let you go without asking you about the Royal Thomian, which is one of the big reasons you're here. Uh, what are your memories of the Royal Thomian from that uh, 1958 game and onwards? 1958 game, that's, that's um, the 58 game is where I fielded you yes. in that one, yeah. That was a draw, of course. Mm -hmm. There was a long series of draws. There was nothing exciting about that match. All those draws were terribly boring. And they were leading in. From the afternoon of the second day, you could say it was going to be an inexorable draw. Very dull, drab, boring cricket. Uh, but 1951 was my first experience when I joined Royal. And that was terribly exciting. One of the most exciting Royal Thurmans I've ever witnessed. I was only 11 or 12 at the time. Uh, Vaira Van Arden was the Royal Captain, I can't remember, I think P.I., no, not P.I. Pires, C.A. Barrow, I think, no, Roger Inman, sorry, Roger Inman was the Thomian Captain, and Thomians were winning in a canter uh, with about an hour's play. They had a, what, 30 or 40 runs to score with plenty of wickets in hand and plenty of time, and suddenly Roger Inman was caught and bowled, and then unexplainably, inexplicably, the side collapsed. Mm. And they had about seven runs to score in the last over of the day, and Vairavanathan, the captain, was bowling. The last man, I think, was Jai Wardana. The third or fourth ball, they clean bowled him. Oh. In Royal One, they snatched victory out of defeat. They had the most exciting match, and the whole crowd went wild. That was terribly exciting, but then after that, 52, 53, and I think 54, we lost badly by the innings, I think. Royal, I mean. And then there was a whole series of draws. And until I left college, we didn't win mm -hmm. again. And after I left and went to England, uh, then I told in between, Royal had won several matches. And over oh, the last few years, I think we won when um, Panditharat, the Gishan Panditharat uh, mm -hmm. was the captain and some Patmanathan. Yes, Devin Patmanathan. Yeah, yeah. Devin Patmanathan. The last three or four years, we won two matches. I yes, the Royal have won. Yeah, last that's years, right. Despite St. Thomas's being favourites. I know. Yeah. Yes, this is how the game changes, mm -hmm. isn't it? Even the match that was done two years ago, St. Thomas has scored over 300 mm -hmm. runs. 400, actually. Oh, 400, whatever it was. And they were fancied to win, but then they collapsed. Yeah. 
inexplicably in their second innings, and Medef does a few runs to score a win. He won. That's, that's how the match goes. You know, this is why a longer game is so exciting. Mm. You know, sometimes low-scoring matches are more interesting than high-scoring sure. matches. It's a lot of excitement and tension. And so the crowd uh, atmosphere, do you oh. get that anywhere else, even in all the international games? No, no, no. The Royal Thurman match is in a class of its own. You never get that sort of feverish excitement in anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. Nowhere. Maybe test matches, yes. I mean, or maybe in India, India, Pakistan matches. But when it comes to college matches, no. Nothing that compares to the Royal Thurman. Uh, I have been complaining over the years. I'm glad that it didn't happen this year. But it happened last year and all these years. Crowd invasions. Mm -hmm. That is the bane of my life as a commentator. I used to condemn it outright every time it happened because they're taking so much time out of the game. Every time a wicket falls or someone scores a 50, the crowd invades and takes so much time out of the game. People have paid money to watch cricket. And it's just not right. And there was so much security around the grounds, army and the police, and they couldn't stop it. Mm -hmm. I spoke loudly and... Uh, about it, but nothing happened. But thankfully this year, apart from one invasion which was quickly quelled, no, there were no invasions which is brilliant. I hope it will continue that way. Yeah, I can't, uh, I can't say too much or agree with you there, Alushan, because I've been guilty of one invasion at least. To be fair, my very good friend had just scored 100, and the fastest 100 at the Royal Thomian at that, at that point as Who well. Who was that? Bhatia Karnaratha in 1997. Oh, Went from 95 to 101 with a six, and I was okay. I was at the it was in the middle before the ball went over the rope. You should have so controlled <laughs> us. You should have controlled us. I should. I should. <laughs> yes. Uh, also, you you've got children in uh, in the UK now. Are they all in um, in England still? Or? Yeah, we, they're not children anymore. They are big men. Am I? <clears throat> as I told you, I don't know, but I did tell you. Um, we went to England in 71 because when everything turned here to Singhala only and we couldn't manage here, uh, looking around the world as to where I could provide the same sort of education to my children that my father was able to give me, it was Hobson's choice, it was England. So there we went. I had to sacrifice a little bit, my wife and I, to, to go there, but we did that quite gladly. And I'm so happy that we did, because both of them are doing extremely well. Uh, my eldest son went to Cambridge University, <coughs> He's now a consultant vascular surgeon. Mm -hmm. uh, he has three sons, and his youngest son is at Oxford. Oh, wow. Okay. So while I was an ardent supporter of Cambridge in the boat race, mm -hmm. now I don't care who wins, <laughs> but it's Oxford or Cambridge, so it's because a I'm a winner either yeah. way, yes. And our youngest son is now, he was at Warwick University, and he's now uh, almost like a deputy headmaster in a school, and he's doing well. Uh, he has a daughter, mm -hmm. and she's the only girl in our family, so she's <laughs> terribly spoiled. Okay. But they're all in university, all the grandchildren, the three grandsons, the granddaughter, they're all in universities in England and doing extremely well. So I'm glad that I went at the right time. Mm -hmm. You've experienced uh, commentary and broadcasting at its highest level, uh, Lucian, is sports broadcasting. Mm -hmm. uh, we run a fledgling operation here at thepapare.com. Uh, what would your advice be to us? Well, far be it from me to advise you guys because uh, the situation and the conditions and so on in Sri Lanka are totally different. Uh, it's highly, highly professionalized in England, terribly streamlined. Everything happens exactly to time. Punctuality is a must. If there's one thing I need to say to people in Sri Lanka, it's punctuality. People here don't seem to worry about time if they say, now I'm not talking about anyone in particular, but generally my experience here is, even with workmen who come to do jobs for me, I'll be there, sir, at 9 o'clock tomorrow, and 10.30, and they haven't arrived. And this is norm for them, and they don't even bother to tell you. Now, that is bad. Um, but your um, organization here at Dialogue, the, the Papare side of it, I know it's been going on for a year, for a few years, but it's still in its embryonic stage. You've got to streamline things quite a bit, and that'll happen with time. It can't happen overnight. So that's the only bit of advice I would give. Get it all streamlined. Get your professionalism going. And you should be fine. Yeah, we we'll hope we will be. Thank you for your advice and thank you for your presence. And we're always happy to have you, Lucian, in the commentary box or anywhere else. Well, I won't be doing any more commentaries, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, I've told the people concerned that um, this is my last year. Oh, at really? Okay. 
I'm not enjoying it anymore okay. because um, for various reasons. So. Fair enough. Okay. Thanks so much for joining All us. All right.